I'm Armando Carvinal. I chair the Department of Planning and Urban Forum here at the Lincoln Institute of Land Policy. And uh, it's always a pleasure to introduce our Lincoln Lectures uh, here in Lincoln House. Uh, but uh, especially so in this case, to introduce to you Dan Perlman, who we've worked with for a long time, uh, going back to when he was teaching uh, biology and uh, uh, ecology at Harvard, uh, now teaching at Brandeis, and now a fellow at the Lincoln Institute uh, of Land Policy on sabbatical from uh, Brandeis. Uh, I want to be sure to say that Dan is the co-author of a Lincoln book, uh, Practical Ecology, uh, and we are soon to have a version, a, a course version on the web based on the book, which does not in any way obviate the book, but actually makes it even more compelling for you to buy the book. The books are available on our website, and uh, of course we can even make a deal here if you're interested. Uh, and the, the point of the book is to make ecology uh, understandable and useful as a way of thinking about the world for people who are planners, developers, and citizens dealing with development issues and plans uh, at the local and regional level. Uh, so it is a book we felt there was a need for, and, and it, it has indeed uh, done very well. Uh, today, uh, Dan is going to be talking about uh, a different project that he's been working on with us and in part with uh, our partners, the uh, Sonoran Institute uh, in Arizona, uh, on uh, the, the subject of conservation in a world of limited resources, which of course is the world we live in, a new method for setting priorities, and as uh, he will tell you, this is more than a theory, it is, uh, it is a method that he's been uh, using in the field and testing, and we have both a kind of theoretical and very practical uh, sense of what, uh, what this is all about. So, Dan Perlman, please come up and give us a talk. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming here, everybody. And what I'll be doing is giving you different viewpoints on this problem of how to set conservation priorities. Uh, my own background is as a conservation biologist and ecologist. But before that, I was a social psychologist. And you'll see the strains of thinking about how people in groups work together to solve problems coming through in this work. Let me also say, I'll put you on warning at various times I will be asking you questions as a group. And um, under those circumstances, it's only fair that you should be able to ask me questions. I may put some off till the end, but if you have questions, if anything's unclear during the talk, feel free to raise a hand. I'd like to acknowledge uh, some of my collaborators from the Sonoran Institute, Marjo Kurgis, John DeBarry, and Stephanie Weigel, very, very thoughtful people who've been very instrumental in thinking about how to develop this new priority setting method. And I would like to thank Armando and Greg and the whole Lincoln Institute for hosting me this year, for working with me over the years. And as Armando said, this has been a long-term relationship. There he is 20 years ago. And uh, so we have been together for a long time. Now, what I'd like to do is just take you on a very brief two-minute tour of a couple of the world's ecosystems so we can think about the setting in which we have to do conservation. This is um, the Amazon rainforest uh, in the eastern part of Ecuador. And I was there just a couple weeks ago. Everybody knows rainforests are extraordinary habitats. This one was no less extraordinary than I expected. I've been in a lot of rainforests, but this was amazing. The diversity there, the um, types of trees. This is a gigantic kapok tree. Uh, just extraordinary sight. Like rainforests everywhere else, it's got these big trees. It's full of these woody vines. And it has organisms like this, the Watson, the only leaf-eating bird in the world. Uh, a couple weeks ago, I was also out in another rainforest, this one in our country, a temperate rainforest on the Olympic Peninsula. Again, this is a site that I'd never, a type of ecosystem I'd never visited. Um, absolutely magnificent, more biomass, more living material in this ecosystem than in any other ecosystem in the world, even than in tropical rainforests, acre for acre. Absolutely beautiful. I had the misfortune of seeing this great temperate rainforest on the one sunny, dry day they probably had in the last six months. But nonetheless, it was a great experience to get there and see things like these gigantic Sitka spruces and western red cedars and other magnificent trees. And there, 
I saw magnificent wildlife as well in our own country. And finally, I just want to introduce you to a, a very exotic spot. This is a spiny forest. This is a unique ecosystem in all the world, found only in parts of southern Madagascar. And what we're going to see here is the spiny forest or spiny desert in the early evening. And you'll hear some sounds. You'll hear first a couple of crickets, and then you will hear two owls hooting back and forth. And I just want to give you a sense, again, of the range of the world's ecosystems. So those are the owls. Really an amazing place, and you can't find it anywhere else in the world. Madagascar has species that you can't find anywhere else in the world, such as all the world's lemurs. So that's the backdrop. We have a remarkable world, incredibly varied, and as we'll discuss, under incredible threats. So we are faced with the age-old problem that Noah had. We have to protect the living part of our planet, and we have to figure out how to do it. In many ways, Noah had a pretty simple task. He was told, take two of each animal. He was actually told, take two of each animal, and for the clean or kosher animals and the fowl of the air, take seven of each species. So I think that was an early example of priority setting and conservation. <laughs> there are certain things to focus on. And he was told, if you build an ark 300 cubits by 50 cubits by 30 cubits, and for those of us of a certain age, you may wonder what's a cubit, but that's a different story. Um, you know, that was a simple task, but we have a much more difficult task. We do know, as you can see, if you look on any technical bookshelf, we know that we've got a problem. We're endangering species, we're endangering ecosystems um, all over the world, in third world, in, in, in first world areas. And it's not just on the technical bookshelves you read about this. Here we have Time Magazine, The New Age of Extinction or just in the last month uh, from Newsweek, a hundred places to remember before they disappear. And this is one of my favorites. This is Monteverde in Costa Rica, where Armando and I and my wife Nora and I have visited many, many times. And just in the last month, we had the America's Great Outdoors Conference led by President Obama talking about the need to protect our nation's natural areas and to connect people with those natural areas. So we're aware of the problem. Now, as I said, in many ways, Noah had it pretty easy. He had to deal with one flood. And just a few weeks ago, I was out in southeastern Washington, and I got to see, for the first time from the air, the effects of a giant flood. There was a glacial lake, Glacial Lake Missoula, 500 cubic miles of water. The glacial <coughs> ice dam holding it back broke catastrophically. It took a week to drain an entire 500 cubic miles, and it scoured this landscape. There you can see some farm buildings, and this is the landscape that was produced by that flood, thinking in terms of Noah. These are giant ripples. There are roads, so it gives you a sense. Some of these ripples, like the little ripples you see at the seashore, some of these were produced 50 feet high. Very, very powerful stuff, this entire canyon was gouged out by this, this flood. But the nice thing about a flood is when it's over, it's gone. So Noah's problem was to get through the flood, and then he was done with his job. He could recolonize the land. Unfortunately, when human beings flood across the landscape, we stay. We don't recede after a week or a month or a year. We're there for the long term. Not only are we there, but we're growing. 6.8 billion of us as of today. Every single day, more than 200,000 additional humans. That's births minus deaths accumulating on the planet. So we have a huge, huge impact across the landscape. Now, again, comparing us with NOAA, we have a better understanding of what our task is. We're not just thinking about two animals or seven of each sex for the kosher animals. We understand that we have many, many species, plants, animals, fungi, bacteria, 
that we are now responsible for as essentially the masters of our world. And we depend on them for our healthy lifestyle. Within species, here's just a single species, Brassica oleracea, we have six different vegetables. We have genetic diversity, something that Noah didn't think about. We have genetic diversity that we have to be aware of as we protect the Earth's biological diversity moving forward. We also need to think about ecosystem diversity. Not only do we have species and genetic diversity, but functioning ecosystems that are in themselves fascinating and important parts of our world's biodiversity. So we have to be thinking on multiple levels. We have to think long term because the flood is just beginning. It's not about to end. We also need to think about what nature does for us. Here's the sink in my parents-in-law house in Queens and their water comes from nature. 125 miles up in the Catskills, 125 miles from New York City, we get wonderful things from nature. It's not just about pretty animals and pretty ecosystems. It's also about human needs and human health. Basically, there are too many of us using too many resources spreading across the landscape, whether it's in Boston or on a hillside in Madagascar or in southeastern Washington. This is an area called the Palouse. It, native habitat is uh, absolutely beautiful bunch grass prairie and today well over 99 percent of the Palouse, this landscape that's covered with between 10 and 200 feet of rich soil everywhere, it's all been turned into wheat and peas and lentils. Fantastic landscape for farming but everything we're looking at in here is an exotic human created species. And as long as we're looking at the Palouse, some of you might be wondering what is the native habitat of the Palouse giant earthworm that has been in the news recently. And that's what we were looking at. It, this, this thing that was supposedly three feet long, smelled of lilies. Now it's uh, maybe seven <coughs> inches long since they've been rediscovered and doesn't smell of lilies. But it's a fascinating piece of biodiversity under extreme threat. It hadn't been seen in 20 years because we've done things like that converting entire ecosystem types to human needs. And if we think about it, anywhere we look, we can get a sense of human impact. We can see the human footprint on nature everywhere, as we see in this picture, the human footprint. <laughs> so I think the biggest thing, and I'm not going to illustrate it here, the biggest piece of our footprint, obviously, in this day and age, is climate change. We are not only affecting physical pieces of our world's geography, we are affecting the functioning of the entire planet with, as you all know, dire possible consequences for us and for everyone else, every other organism on the planet. So that's what we're doing. In order to do our job of protecting biodiversity, of conserving the nature around us, we need resources. Just to give you a quick, very brief idea of what some of these resources needed are. According to a recent uh, Government Accountability Office report, the decurrent false aster, or known as the clasping leaf doll's daisy, an obscure little flower in Illinois, would need $58,000 for its complete recovery plan. Contrast that with the California condor, one of the great now success stories of conservation, which still needs $5 million a year for the 330 some odd condors that we have alive today, still requires $5 million every year to keep that program going. From the GAO report, the hooping crane, one of, another great success story, GAO estimates it would take $125 million for the full recovery of a single species, the hooping crane. And then the king of them all, is the cluster of about half dozen Pacific salmon species in the Pacific Northwest. And even though they get their money through a different source, they get a lot of money. They're getting on the neighborhood of $80 million each year for salmon recovery in the Pacific Northwest. Very significant amounts of money. Um, and in this day and age of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of billion dollars of annual deficits, it's harder and harder to come up with this money. If we look not just at species, but at landscapes and pieces of the land, 
one of the more interesting pieces of the federal government is the little known Land and Water Conservation Fund. Maybe a number of people in this audience probably know of it. Established in 1965 with money, ironically, from offshore drilling rigs for oil and gas. Every year since 1965, it has been authorized to receive $900 million to buy land by the federal government or to donate land to states to buy land for their needs. Every year authorized at $900 million. That $900 million has not risen in those 45 years. And only once in those 45 years have we hit the $900 million figure. And as we look here, uh, over about a decade from 1996 to 2008, the federal side of it, the four federal land management agencies, apart from the one year of 1998, and I think these must be inflation adjusted numbers since it's above 900 million, very low figures, way, way below the 900. And even if we add in the state numbers, all of which are under 150 million a year and, and some are down basically at zero, very, the, every year they're supposed to plunk $900 million into these accounts to buy <coughs> land. Um, and at this point, we have over $17 billion that this fund is owed by the federal government that they've never allocated for it. So big needs, and frankly, $900 million a year does not go very far in the land buying business, but we're not even getting that through this program. So tremendous need on the resources, tremendous need to take care of the planet around us. Clearly, we need to set priorities. We have huge need and insufficient resources. We need to set priorities. And so that's the focus of what I've been doing over the last couple of years, and especially during this year with Lincoln and Sonoran. So let's take a break. Let me ask you folks, I want you to think, and you can talk with your neighbor, take a minute, minute and a half. If you were setting priorities for the natural world, and I'm gonna leave it very broad, the natural world, what would you like to protect? And you can be as specific in this or as general as you want. You can talk about categories. You can talk about absolute detailed specifics. What would you like to protect? And then we'll get some of these ideas up on the board. So write down yourself. Talk to your neighbor. Let's get, uh, get some ideas out here. What would you protect? So large <coughs> natural habitats. I'm going to abbreviate. Good. So water levels for healthy aquatic ecosystems. Bluefin tuna. And why would you like to protect bluefin tuna, Gus? Why? Essence of the whole cuisine. Essence of the whole cuisine. It's delicious. OK. OK. What else? What else do we have? The back of the room has been very quiet. I'm not afraid to call on people. So yes? Clean water and air. Clean water and air. Okay. Everything, and if you can't protect everything, the most important. Okay. That's a, that's a, yeah, we should talk about priority setting during this session. Okay. Yeah. Healthy interconnected ecosystems. Okay. So that's going to include not only the aquatic, but terrestrial. Um, Notice I put this over, pay no attention to that man behind the line. Um, anything else along these specifics that we want to protect? Yeah, way in back. Uh, I would protect places that are still pristine and, and roadless. And okay. Stay that way. Okay. And, yep. Keystone species. Okay. Salmon's a good one. So pristine places, keystone species that are essential for good functioning of ecosystems. Okay, marine species. I'm going to put coral reefs over here. What else? We'll take one or two more, Armando. Beautiful places. Beautiful places. Humor. Maybe I should, beautiful places, maybe I should put that up with delicious bluefin <laughs> tuna. But beautiful places. Humans. The great apes. Great apes. Okay. This is excellent. Let's just pause here for a second and look at what we've done. The strongest environmental protection law, at least from a conservation point of view in our, in our country, is the Endangered Species Act. 
which covers things like great apes, delicious bluefin tuna, vegetarian jumping spiders, and humans I will put because we are one species. Um, we also have groups of species such as the marine species here. But as it is written, apart from protecting critical habitat for the sake of individual species, the Endangered Species Act does not talk about large <coughs> native habitats, uh, healthy aquatic ecosystems, healthy terrestrial ecosystems, or clean water and air for people and the world around. Everything, the most important, beautiful places. Notice that in just five minutes, we've put up a list that includes certain species, some of which are very charismatic, some of which are very tasty, others which are very obscure but interesting. Um, and then habitats, ecosystems, and what the, the species that make them function. We've got a very, very wide range of goals here, including some very human-focused ones. We want beautiful places. We want delicious things. We want the things that we deem most important. Keystone species is um, a species in an ecosystem that has a very, very outsized impact on the functioning of that ecosystem relative to the numbers, such as. Such as um, one of the, the best-known examples is um, let me go with the otter, the sea otter. Uh, sea otters off the Pacific coast, their favorite food is sea urchins. Um, if there are sea otters in an ecosystem, they eat the sea urchins. Sea urchins eat the big giant kelp, which are there. So if you've got otters, you don't have urchins. So you do have kelp forests, and you have a lot of fish that live in the kelp. If, as we've done, we take away the sea otters, we kill them all for their skins, no otters, now you've got a spike in urchin number. They eat up all the kelp and the habitat for all the dozens and hundreds of fish species that live in the kelp are gone. So by taking out one species, you disrupt an entire ecosystem. And it wasn't obvious at the beginning that if we take away otters, the whole thing's going to fall to part pieces. Okay? So look at the range of stuff we've got up there. And I'm going to compare that with what conservation biologists are talking about in the literature and in practice and then with what I'm trying to do. So do our current priority setting methods actually help us protect the things we want to protect? Well, let's go to the literature. Let's look at what the people, and there's, there's a small group of people really extremely active in this in, in academic conservation biology. Let's see what they say. So to begin with, where reserve system design is implemented, good, we're going to design a set of nature reserves, it quickly becomes apparent that society is not a single entity with a single value system. That's excellent. That's what we're talking about here. We've got a lot of different values. And these authors say they need to develop models that contractably evaluate multiple biological and social objectives that are measured in different currencies. Excellent, because there's no one currency that allows us to deal with vegetarian spiders and water levels for healthy aquatic ecosystems. So we need different, different ways of approaching them. That's great. And then another group, ultimately any decisions about what to save first, so Greg's what's most important, should include judgments that cannot be made by scientists or managers alone. I applaud that as well. Now these kind of statements tend to come at the beginning of papers, in the introductions. As you dig a little deeper into these two papers, you'll see things like in the first one, we're talking about multiple biological and social objectives, different currencies, such as representation, meaning we have all the species accounted for, probabilities of extinction, frequency and magnitude of disturbance events, things like natural fire, natural windstorms. <coughs> this sounds to me like a bunch of professional biologists deciding what they want to have covered. They're not really thinking about social objectives from a wide range of people, in one and a half minutes we came up with a much, much wider range of things that we want to protect than they have there. In this one, what to say first should include judgments not just by managers and scientists. And they say optimal allocation is one simple and attractive approach to prioritization that should, could inform decisions about how to allocate resources between species. 
optimal allocation. So we're going to try to define the problem in such a way as clearly as possible, which is good, but we're going to try to define it so we can find the optimum solution to our problem. And I would suggest, looking at our two charts over there, that there's not one optimum. This is a very complex, very messy, very rich set of issues we're dealing with here, and I don't see any way that we can come up with an optimum. Here's another one, similar overlapping group of people. We require an explicit statement of the overall conservation objective. I think that's great. Let's be explicit. Our objective is to maximize the total number of species, vascular plants and vertebrates combined, conserved across these ecoregions. These are some of the guys who are aiming for optimal solutions. In order to work in that, that particular intellectual area, you need to have an extremely clearly defined problem. And they're saying, our problem is to maximize the total number of plant species and vertebrates that we protect. Again, contrast that with what we did in less than two minutes. Incredibly narrow view of what the problem is. This is basically as Noah saw it. We're going to count them all up. We're going to check them all off. We're going to get as many as we can, and then we're done. It doesn't talk about healthy ecosystems. It doesn't talk about human values. It just says, we've got a checklist of species, and we're going to get as many as we can. Potentially leaves out a keystone species. Potentially leaves out a keystone species. Does this make sense to people? That um, what I'm saying here is, this is a checklist approach. And what we came up with here in just a couple minutes is much, much richer, and I think much more valuable to us and to the health of the planet. So questions? What if you conserve kind of generally across the board and then these values rise up out of it? If we could conserve everything, we would be all set. Okay, well, you can. I mean, as much as you can. If we conserve as much as we can, but we don't do it thoughtfully, we're going to miss a lot of really good stuff. If we say, we've got a checklist, and we're going to work our way down this checklist, alphabetically or in some other order, we may be missing some good stuff that we don't get to. We need to make sure we focus on the important stuff right up at the beginning. Just to give you a sense of the mindset, these are very, very bright people who have put a lot of thought into it, but I disagree heartily with the way they're going about things. This is a big picture of um, all the things that go into making conservation decisions. And in one third of it, we keep talking about optimality, Optimization methods requires alternative near optimal, optimizes allocation. So in this um, concept map, optimality is hugely important. If we think about multiple biological and social objectives, not just scientists and managers, we look at this graph again, there's only one place where stakeholder opinion, you guys, we guys, we're the stakeholders, stakeholder opinion appears one place, Optimality appears four places. I don't think this is a problem that can be solved with an optimal solution. I think it's one that's going to be messy and needs stakeholder voices. And there are some professional conservation biologists who agree. Um, these guys are saying the recommendations of systematic conservation <coughs> assessments, the kind of stuff we've been talking about, are often difficult to implement because they've adopted a purely scientific and biological approach. You know, what these guys have been talking about is purely scientific and biological approach to area selection and have not accounted for social, economic, and political factors that actually determine the success of conservation planning. We need to include society, economic factors. Or in this one, a decade of work on reserve selection methods, especially with these computer algorithms, no complete set of areas produced by such complete computer algorithms has been implemented anywhere in real world regional biodiversity planning. The research focus for priority setting on these optimization methods and for finding an optimal set, they keep focusing on that even while few prospects may exist for actual implementation of such optimal sets. So that's the counter argument. That's what I'm, I'm buying into. So what is the problem that's being addressed? Are we trying to protect a list of the world's vascular plants and vertebrates? Or are we trying to address a much richer list? And who decides 
which of those problems gets addressed. I'm just wondering if it might be uh, useful to think in terms of inverting the problem and addressing the threats and then allow natural processes to take care of the rest. That's a good question. Should we just think about the threats and then allow natural processes to take care of the rest? Absolutely, but we have to figure out which threats where, and to decide which threats where, we have to decide what are the things that are threatened, that whose threats we want to focus on. So we need to work in specific places against specific threats, and how do we decide which places? So that's a very good point. We've got to work on the threats, but we still need to decide where we're going to work. According to these previous authors I've been showing you, they keep saying it's a broad problem, we need society, and we're going to tell you what, we what, what we're going to focus on, and I think that doesn't work. So let's now get out of the realm of the theoretical, roll up our sleeves. This is a workshop that some of the Sonoran folks and I did in southwestern Colorado, a uh, li little local land trust and many agencies that they coordinate with, federal, state, county, um, non-governmental, ranchers, all kinds of people, and they have three missions. And so we were going to try to, we ran a two-day priority setting workshop, and I'll describe that for you. They have three missions. They want to conserve agricultural, natural, and scenic open space resources. Agricultural, natural, and scenic open space resources. I kept asking them, so which one of these is most important? Because I'm sure one's really important and the other two are not quite. No, 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 they're all equally important. So far from just saying we're going to get a list of species and check them off, they say we want agricultural resources protected, <coughs> scenic open space, and natural. Three very, very different things that really are incommensurable values. There is no single currency, no single ruler that we can use to measure value in agricultural resources versus value in scenic open space or natural resources. We have the classic apples and oranges problem. How do you compare an agricultural resource with a natural resource? And that's, once we buy into the fact that there are going to be a lot of stakeholders with a lot of views and a lot of different values, we can't escape that. So they, they wanted two things to come out of their priority setting process, two knotty problems they were wrestling with. One, people offer them parcels. They say, I've got a piece of land. Would you please put a conservation easement on this or buy it from me? They need to assess different parcels. Is this a good parcel? Should we put our money into it? Should we not? Even if it's being offered for free, it's going to take a lot of staff time to, for stewardship. Should we accept it? Does it further our mission of protecting those three resources? And when they step back and do a strategic look, they need to assess the whole service area and find those areas, those geographic areas on which to focus. So parcel by parcel, is this good? Is this not as good? How do we compare them? And as we look over our whole region, what do we get? And what they've been doing since our workshop uh, just two years ago is they've been working through this process that we began in the workshop and they have a scorecard where they look at each given parcel. This is for the parcel by parcel. And they ask for the natural resources, the species, um, which features of it are rated as an A or a B or a C. And for the scenic values, how does it rank out? And for the uh, agricultural values, how does it rank out? And we came up with this idea of grading in the workshop, and I'll explain it more in a sense, but here's a good snapshot that allows them to look at two different sites and say, well, according to the things that we think are important, how do these sites compare? Does that make sense to people? And then for the strategic look, they've, they, this is a spatially explicit GIS, geographic information system based system uh, process and they've taken the data that they have for their two county service area and they've been able to identify this kind of greenish here. These are priority areas for them to focus on and the absolute top priority, the Ivan's Ranch, is up here as an inholding in the National Forest. So that's top of their list if they can pull it off. But the, this kind of green are priority areas and within those they have rankings as well. 
So they're able to take the big picture and also look parcel by parcel. So we do have our apples and oranges problem. The old saying, you can't compare apples and oranges. Well, actually we do it every day. If there's a bowl of fruit in front of you and you're reaching for one piece of fruit, you have to figure out how to compare apples and oranges. You've got to do it somehow. Now the fact of the matter is, the things that make for a good apple are very different for the things that make for a good orange. They have different features. We grade them, we think about them in different dimensions. Um, let me ask first for apples. What are some of the things you look for? You're looking for a good apple. What are you looking for? Yeah, I'm going to reach for an apple. I want it to be good. What do you look for? Crisp. Crisp. Crispy. Tart. 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 No bruises. No bruises. Not mealy. Not mealy. So if we think of each of those dimensions, it's crispness, it's bruisedness, it's mealiness, it's tartness, um, maybe it's sweetness, okay? All of those are dimensions on which we grade apples, but when I'm reaching for an orange, I'm not thinking, gee, how crisp is this orange going to be? How tart is this orange going to be? You, you use different measures. You think sweetness, juiciness, peelability, things like that. And we assess those things, we put them together in our head, and somehow we decide to reach for one or the other. Even though we are comparing apples and oranges, we're able to coordinate that and decide. Now, let me just show you a slightly different version of this picture. Okay? When I showed this, I thought, well, the, the context has changed. It would be obvious, going back to the bruisedness idea, that this is something uh, that I would not want to reach for. But the first time I showed this in this workshop in uh, Colorado, somebody immediately said, oh, that's the first thing I would reach for. Why would you reach for that apple first? Under what context? Under what circumstances? Because it has the shorter shelf life. Shorter shelf life. And what could you do with it at this point? Make applesauce. OK? I want to make use of it. It's about to expire. It's, you know, it's, it's uh, on the threatened and endangered list, that apple. So I'm going to make use of it. I'm going to grab it now. I'm going to use it for applesauce. And the other things can wait. The threats to these other fruit are somewhat lower. There's an imminent threat to that. And if we look at the great philosopher Kevin Garnett in the Boston Globe this week, he, he encapsulated this beautifully. He's, talking, he's comparing LeBron James and Michael Jordan. He says, new era, new rules. So those are two different contexts. We have the Michael Jordan era context and today's context. Two contexts, different tales of the tape. Those are the different dimensions or features. Sweetness, ability to jump, long range ju jump shot. You know, different tales of the tape. Apples and oranges. Both of them are sweet. You love both of them. They're both good for you. But we're using different methods to assess LeBron and Michael. And the context has changed. And we always have to think about the context. So I think for me, this really captures what we're trying to get at here. Think about context. Think in multiple dimensions. Don't just have a checklist of species. Reprising that, that quote we saw before, society is not a single entity with a single value system. There are multiple biological and social objectives that are measured in different currencies. Now, sometimes when you're out in the real world setting priorities with the Montezuma Land Conservancy, something comes in across your doorstep, and it's a slam dunk. The Redburn Ranch is beautiful agricultural soils in a gorgeous setting. One of the, the, the main road going through this valley goes right by this ranch, so it's scenic open space. It has some very nice habitat back there. So if you're thinking in terms of scenic open space, it gets an A. If you're thinking in terms of um, agricultural resources, gets an A. Natural resources gets an A. And so when the Redburn Ranch came up and they said, would you like an easement on our place? Of course we do. But most issues are a lot harder than this one's a slam dunk, no question. So what we did in the workshop was we took those three core values, agricultural, natural, and scenic open space resource, and we said, what do you mean by each of those? We really had to break it down. And it was a fascinating experience. We had local ranchers, as I said, people from a variety of government agencies at all levels. We even had the bank president, the local bank president there. And I knew I was not in Cambridge anymore because the bank president is named Slim. 
<laughs> now, in my more recent workshop out in Southern California in the Morongo Basin in the Mojave Desert, there we weren't dealing with a single land trust and their agencies. We were dealing with about 20 partner groups, uh, government agencies, land trusts, and everything including um, a national park, the Joshua Tree National Park, and a Marine Corps base, the Air Ground Combat Center at 29 Palms. Very, very different context. And I also knew I wasn't in Cambridge because this is where we held the retreat at the Spiritual Retreat Center Institute of Mental Physics. You know, I'm, I'm not back in Boston. We're not in Kansas anymore, Toto. So what we did in the course of the workshop, this is going back to the Colorado one, we kept forcing the question, what do you mean? What's important when you say we want to protect agricultural values? Well, the size of the source is important. The size of the site is important. The water rights are important. Each one of these dots meant that somebody voted for that being important. Soil, what it's adjacent to, and so on. So we did a lot of brainstorming. We did voting like this. We came up with a whole list of ideas. What's important when we say we want to protect natural resources? Here we're looking at ecosystems, water and riparian habitats, the potential for those, um, how much it's fragmented, the underlying geology, uh, is it part of a biological corridor? Is it a specific type of habitat, a sagebrush habitat? Things like that. On the species level, we had a bunch of different issues, including listed species, threatened and endangered species, and <coughs> elk. Not because they're threatened and endangered. In no way are they threatened and endangered. But people there like to hunt them and like to eat them. So this is on their list of what's important even though it's not threatened. Now, at this point, we have our lists. We winnowed those down a little bit because they were too, too unwieldy. We came up with a series of features, like in our apple, the crispness, the tartness, the bruisedness. And these were things like, for example, uh, in the agricultural, we'd say things like size. How big is it? And we would put grades on different sizes. What are the soil types? And we would attach grades to those. And so if we look at this, this is part of that brainstorming. We had different values, sorry, different features, the key aspects of, of the issue, the value under consideration. So size, soil type, water rights. And then we tried to come up with an order, a ranking for different features, sorry, different particulars under there. So uh, one soil type might be top rated. Another soil type or two soil types might be just a little bit worse. A fourth soil type might be further down. And so we were trying to say what's most important to us in different dimensions, and then within those dimensions, what's important. In habitat types, is sagebrush at the top of our list, or second down, or third down? Well, mountain mahogany is the most important one and sagebrush is further down. Maybe pinyon juniper is about like sagebrush. And so we went back and forth, and this took the better part of a day, going back and forth, trying to rank order. Each little working group had to come up with consensus. What's most important? What's second most important? It was hard work. There were a lot of things changing. But by the end of that period, it worked very, very well. People had a real strong consensus. Judy. When you were talking about the agricultural value, I understood that there would be A's, B's, and C's, better agricultural value or not. But then when you talked about habitat, those are just, those are just which you like. So how did you rank some habitats as A's and some as C's? How did they? Good question. Um, that subgroup included a number of professional biologists who had very good knowledge of the area, as well as some ordinary citizens. And so we had multiple viewpoints, multiple stakeholders saying, this is important for the following reasons, and trying to explain it. And you know, one of the reasons would be, how rare is it? Well, this is a very rare habitat, so those, this goes to the top of our list. Or we know that is part of a biological corridor that a lot of animals are going to use. So that's an A ranking. It's not part of a biological corridor, it goes down. Another key feature in all of these workshops is how badly infested is it with exotic weeds? 
If it's not very infested, that's good. If it's a little infested, that's fair. If it's heavily infested, that's down the bottom of the list. So we, we found ways to do it. And in some cases, we're calling on the experts which of these is most important. The point here is these judgments are out in the open. And we keep this information clear. We write this up. And it can always be changed. And in the California example, in the Colorado example, over the months after the workshop, they kept adjusting. And, but they always had it in front of them so they could see what do we value and how do we rank things. Rather than saying we've got a checklist of species and we're going to run down them, down them, they have tried to take what we've listed here, abstract the most important things. We like healthy habitats. We like things that are delicious. We like things that are beautiful. We've tried to abstract them and say, well, what do you mean by a healthy habitat? What do you mean by something beautiful? and put it into practice so when we're in that area, we can say, this is an important area, this is an important subregion for um, a certain habitat. Making sense? This is tricky stuff, and it took two-day workshops to get this through to people. I'm trying to do it here in less than an hour with you, so if you're with me so far, we're way ahead of the game. Um, so there's Peter Pollock of the Lincoln Institute, who was very, very helpful in this last um, Mojave Desert workshop. And the workshop, this workshop, the Mojave workshop, was in October. But they have really been cranking on this, really trying to articulate what it is that they find valuable. Now, they had five different core values, wildlife connectivity and habitat. They had a large study that they had done by a bunch of professional biologists that said, here are the wildlife corridors we think are most important. By the way, this is the Joshua Tree National Park. This is the Marine Corps Air Base, and this area in between, which I kind of think of as the hamburger between the two halves of the bun, this is all private and Bureau of Land Management land that can be managed in some way. And so the red areas are especially important for wildlife connectivity and habitat. And the blue areas are least important, and those tend to cluster around the cities. We're saying we're, we're giving up on those. So that's for one of the five values. For buffering the national park, that's an important thing in this area. They really want to help protect the national park. So most of the important red areas are right near the national park. Community separators. As it turns out, this region has three cities, Yucca Valley, the town of Joshua Tree, and 29 Palms. And there's one highway that goes between them. And as you leave each of them, you come to the edge of town, and it's open space. It is Joshua Tree habitat. It is really beautiful, beautiful desert. And that's very important to people. And so they want to keep that. And so these areas on the edges of town and a few other areas um, are especially important to separate the community so they don't become Route 1 in its entirety along there. So an important and good effort. Community views and treasures. These are the little things that people value that they've been able to articulate and say where they are, and then through this process try to rank and say, these are some of the most important things. Um, in Colorado, there was an iconic view of Sleeping Ute Mountain. That was the biggest mountain in the area. Everybody knew it. We had to protect those views. So that's the kind of thing here. And then I don't expect I will run into this in too many other workshops. But buffering the Marine Corps base and its mission. And basically, this is trying to protect some of the fly zones into the base because they don't want to be hurting people or native habitats in the areas they fly over. Um, so that was fascinating. But the guys on the base were very, very, men and women, were very involved in this, very committed to working with all their neighbors to protect the region as best they could. So very interesting process, a long-term process of articulating the general values, making them more and more specific, ranking them, creating grades, and trying to calibrate grades so that you're able to say a really tart apple is approximately as equal as a really sweet orange, and working that way. A really beautiful piece of mountain mahogany habitat is comparable to a nice piece of agricultural land with good water rights. And I see those as roughly equal so that when I have to make those decisions, I can weigh them out even though I'm comparing apples and oranges, or ag land and native habitat, 
through this collaborative brainstorming process, we have consensus on what's roughly equal to what. So just to wrap up, I just want to emphasize a few different things about my process. It's spatially explicit and supported by geographic information systems. Unlike those tools that I referenced from the other conservation biologists, which are data driven and focused on reaching optimal or near optimal solutions, and they assume the values. The values are we want to check off as many species as we can. This system is values driven and supported by data. The first place we start is what's important to you? What are your values? Then let's articulate them. Then let's try to calibrate them so we know which values are roughly equal to which. Very different, not starting with the data, but using the data to support the values. In my process, the process that I've worked on with these Sonoran Institute folks, these different local groups, everything is out in the open. Those, those big data matrices, they're right there. We can see it's all transparent. If somebody disagrees, we can move the post-its around. Nothing is set in stone, and you can always go back and figure out if we say thus, this ranch is very, very valuable, you can decide why is that ranch valuable. You go back to the data tables. And finally, you have buy-in from a very wide range of stakeholder groups rather than a bunch of conservation biologists parachuting in and saying, we're going to tell you what's important. We're going to tell you how to protect it. Just listen to us, and we've got the answers. Instead, you have groups ranging from the Marine Corps base, the National Park, the local water district, the Home Builders Association, the local land trust, everybody part of this process saying, what do we value in this community? Now, I've done this mostly at local levels. Um, a couple of counties, part of a gigantic county, the biggest in the country. But I've also proposed this idea to groups such as the Washington State Chapter of the Nature Conservancy. I met with them just recently. Uh, Conservation International, which has a global purview. And in both of those cases, where we talked about how this might work, they got really, really excited. So my hope would be that we can take this methodology and not just use it locally, but use it at multiple levels. So we have a global view, national or regional view, and then local view, all interacting, all thinking about what the different values are so we can do a good job of protecting our landscape. And this picture that I took just before the first workshop I led, which was in Montana, reminds me why I'm in this business. This was a four-day powwow of the Blackfeet Indian Nation, not a tourist event. It was just done for themselves. If guests wanted to come, we were welcome, but it was not for us. And clearly, this is a group of people who are very tied to their local biodiversity, to their local landscape. They're deeply connected to it, and that came through in their dress, in their songs, in their dances. And in this moment, I saw a grandmother, a father, and a daughter. And it reminded me, this is why I'm in it. We receive the world from our parents. We give it to our children and our grandchildren. And at this time, with 6.8 million people on the planet, 200,000 more people every day, we have to make some good decisions, and we have to make them fast so that we leave a good world for those who come after us. So thank you very much for your attention, and I'll be glad to take questions. The last example you showed is a spatial GIS match is what they value. I guess my question is, is the strategic plan the overlay of all those five and the summation of all the yes. possible mice that you took? And we're still negotiating how that exactly works. We're, we're trying out a couple different things, but yes, the overall strategic plan would make use of these different layers. Those are basically different layers representing different values. The overlay of all of these exactly. the totality of all the possible. Exactly. Although I sh one thing I didn't mention is um, in our grading system, we did allow for what we call an A+. Plus. If there is some particular about a site that is so spectacular that you want to run out the door and nail it, you know, sign the contract right now, that becomes, regardless of what else is going on there, that becomes top of the list. But otherwise, we'll do some kind of summation across these layers to come up with an overall strategy. Yeah. Okay, let's work back. Um, I was 
Thanks for the presentation. It was wonderful. I was wondering how you, um, who was in the room? Uh, how did you ensure representation of some kind? How did you go out and seek underrepresented minorities? Very, very good question. Who, who was in the room? How did we get a good group? Um, in these cases, I left it up to the group I was working with, and and because they knew the local local terrain, and I was impressed in. Um, the Montana, the Colorado, and the uh, Southern California workshops with the wide range of people they had. And in some cases, we had some really obstreperous people, which I think was a very good sign that they didn't just bring their friends and neighbors. Um, so we had people in the usual suspects of organizations, the, the Forest Service, the Park Service, the State Fish and Wildlife, but we also had ordinary citizens who care deeply about this stuff. And so um, that's an excellent question. We do have to make sure there's a wide representation. Um, the folks in the Morongo <coughs> Basin are bringing this out to the community, and they're saying, this is what we're doing. What do you guys think of it? So even if people weren't in the workshop, they have a chance to have input now. But that's a critical thing, and I don't, I don't have an easy answer for how you guarantee good breadth, but that's critical. How, how did you deal with conflict resolution between uh, these uh, agreed upon values. For example, we need uh, intact agricultural settings and we need, you know, valuable wildlife habitats, let's, let's say. But then to get a viable agricultural setting there, water withdrawal has very major negative impacts on wildlife habitats that could be miles uh, away. So, uh, you know, how did you uh, handle situations like that? That's a good question. I'm going to answer it in two parts. Um, the first facile answer is we didn't have to in places like southwestern Colorado and southern California because they are so arid and the water rights are so clearly defined and constrained. That question is over and done with. You know, we can't go in there and say, oh, wouldn't it be nice if you, you on this agricultural parcel didn't use all your water and gave it to somebody else? That's, you know, that's 100 plus years of legislation and, and adjudication. So in those particular settings for the, that particular question, that's just part of the pack background, the context. Um, I think in other cases where we had to juggle between competing values, what we had was some horse trading going on. We're trying to reach consensus. What's important to you on the ag side? Let me tell you what's important to me on the natural side. And if I really listen to you and I say, okay, you know, that's not really important to me, but I understand that, we were able to each give a little and, and accommodate each other as saying, this is really important to our community, and you're representing one part of it, I'm representing a different set of views. Um, in the case of something like water, it's going to be really, really tricky, and, and I don't have an easy answer for that. Um, in these cases, the answer was already taken care of because it was over and done. But Back to this side, I think. Yes, sir. Um, I just wonder how you take into account limited resources and opportunities. You know, they have the eight plus property that uses up three quarters of your available funding, or you may have three B plus properties that are all for sale, and uh, right. your A's are uh, owned by. Uh, Unfriendly landowners. <laughs> right. Ex excellent question. Um, how do you balance resources with your priorities? Um, we talked about incorporating economic factors into this priority setting process itself. And then we said, no, let's, we need to be very cognizant of the economics, but let's set our priorities first because the resource side can change. We might have more or less cash in the future. The price of a given property might drop or go up in the future. So let's set our priorities based on our values. And then once we have that list, here's our top priority, the Ivan's Ranch, and here's the next one and the next one. We start comparing um, those against our potential resources. Um, we also try to do some matching. Here's an incredible resource, uh, incre incredible site, the Ivan's Ranch, and somebody uh, at the federal level just put out a call for grants, and they're interested in riparian habitat, and you know what, there's a lot of riparian habitat. Maybe we can get some more money there by applying for that. But basically, you, what you have to find out is 
given that we've got our priority list of sites, and given we've got our little pot of money, when we get to this one, does it feel like, you know, the, if we're going to lose half of our money on it, is it a good value? And if it isn't, we'll, we'll say, okay, you know, the Ivan's Ranch is too expensive right now for what we have. Let's set that aside. We know it is our top priority. It will remain our top priority probably. But let's see about the price of the second and third and fourth sites and see if those feel like a better value per dollar given our limited resources. Does that make sense? I, I guess I just think that all these priority setting um, uh, matrices or whatever need also a process um, uh, discussion at the end because you know all of this takes place in real time. And yes. You, you don't get to do everything you want to do, and right. you have to figure out uh, how you're going to deal with projects as they arise one by one. Which is why, I mean, we have the two, two aspects, the strategic overlay, but also the checklist of um, the, the score sheet, where uh, when a project came in, said, okay, well, how is it under ag for size, soils, water? How is it for scenic? Does it have an iconic view? Do people travel there very often? And so they could get a score sheet right off the bat and say, okay, this looks like something really good or it's not so good. So they could do that in real time, and they've been doing that. The, uh, the Montezuma folks um, have been doing that with their board. They hand them a score sheet, and they glance at them, and they say, okay, we know this is a really solid project or not. So I think that's a good point, but I think it's one we're, we're wrestling with pretty well. Sir, uh, this um, <clears throat> seems to me to be an application of sort of classical suitability analysis to a very particular problem, which is prioritizing acquisitions of land but it also represents uh, the kind of uh, anecdotal uh, assembly of values and all the things that you've been talking about that could be the basis of an actual planning and design process for this region. But it would seem to me that it would have to be followed by examination from a scientific perspective on the one hand of well wait a minute what are the actual range requirements of various species and so forth and are these environmental corridors that we're identifying actually adequate mm -hmm. to uh, the objectives that have been set out in the values oriented study and then further another uh, exploration which uh, has to do with design alternatives within this construct of uh, a uh, sort of values-oriented suitability analysis com combined with a scientific one and some kind of feedback process that would lead people to actual uh, design alternatives. And so the question is, uh, is there a plan in a, in a case like this to follow this study with others that go in, in these other directions that I mentioned? That's a good question. A um, couple thoughts. One. My hope, as I said, is to have this process operating on multiple levels. So you have the local level, in this case part of the county, a regional level, which in a sense would be oversight, and there could take the bigger picture and say, well, are these possibilities serving the needs of wildlife corridors and so on? So you don't just have one group um, setting the priorities. You have multiple levels who are also looking at the same, same area. Um, I mean, the Morongo Basin Group, these folks, are looking at both conservation and development of their basin and trying to guide the process. Um, and they have a whole, you know, planners from the base, from the park, from the different municipalities who are a part of this. So this will feed into other planning processes. Now, to the extent, I don't know to what extent those planning groups in the different agencies and, and municipalities are talking to each other well. But I think this process that they had in place before I got out there, the Morongo Basin Open Space Group, I think it will work very well with that kind of planning process. And I'm hoping they'll follow up with that. Okay, one more. Uh, well, I noticed that in most of the West was subdivided into basic uh, squares. And so uh, it looks like a matrix, but actually it's a bunch of private land that's been segregated from each other by uh, ownership. And then you introduce fences. Well, the difference between the Indians and, and the, the ranchers was the Indians never imposed fences on the migration routes 
It might have gone from one tribal land to another, but there wasn't anything interfering with the bison herd crossing from one uh, region to another. So, so it seems to me that uh, that was, so the question is, uh, have you viewed historical pre-colonialization uh, patterns of ownership uh, to migratory routes, uh, which would then be sort of a natural historical representation of what they mm -hmm. ought to be, mm -hmm. and then try to connect the dots. That's, that's a really good point. We haven't done that. Um, I think in some of these areas there may be reasonable data on it. Other areas there may not be, but that, I think that would be a good piece of this mix to try to find out what, what, if anything, the historical record tells us about how these native ecosystems functioned over a broader, broader area. So I, I like that idea and I'll try to follow up on it. Thank you. Okay, well, uh, one more and uh, <coughs> then a chance to, to greet Dan. Go ahead. I was wondering if you thought about how you might do this with people who don't know they have to do this. Here you have motivated a land trust or um, a particular resource, but you know when we start thinking about the big picture, we we have to as a society start doing this. If you thought about how you might bring this up to a much larger scale, you know whether it's climate change or, or bio regions or something like that. Um, good question. Um, My take on it would be when people hear that they can do this, that they can think about shaping the place where they live, place being small, medium, or large, um, it's very, very empowering. And, and people want to take part in that. You mean you're going to listen to me and I get to tell you what's important about this area? Um, so I think getting them interested in it is, is not all that hard. Getting them to come to the, to the initial meetings, I think I would take a page from the Lincoln Institute and put out really good free food and try to get them in that way. But once, once they hear the pitch, um, you know, you care what I think about this and you're really gonna listen and it, this is not just for show. People really bought into it and, and wanted to throw themselves into this wholeheartedly. Um, I don't know, will that really scale up to really broad regions? That's one of the big questions. I have these hints from Conservation International and the Nature Conservancy who are very excited. They think it'll work, but that's, that's a question that I have still waiting out there for me. Well, it's, it's a great opening for me to mention that at the Lincoln Institute for about the last 10 years, we've been working on what's called landscape scale conservation and have a policy focus report on that that will be coming out very soon and it, it actually kind of deals with this question of how to bring to scale the sort of activities that Dan has been telling you about and how to support the sorts of coalitions and collaborative efforts that are needed to deal with you know, larger than county level uh, landscapes and, and habitats and ecosystems. So let's thank uh, Dan again. And thank you. Thank you.